think everything's in order. We're just about to start, so um, <coughs> can I just say um, it's marvelous to see so many of you here this afternoon. Um, we're in the middle of the teaching day, and it's very much appreciated by myself and the rest of the sociology team uh, that we have such a, an impressive turnout this afternoon. So let me begin by extending a very warm welcome to you all to our independence referendum discussion. Um, on behalf of myself as the program leader for the psychology sociology program and on behalf of the sociology team and our head of division and dean of school. Our topic for debate for the next two hours is in all likelihood the political topic of our times. It would be difficult, I think, to have a more portentous or a more faithful um, discussion than the one we're about to have. Um, whether come September um, we as a nation decide to resume an old song and become an independent, free, sovereign nation state and make our way um, in the world and through history as a new nation state, or whether come September we decide to renew, to renegotiate perhaps, but to essentially retain our political union with England. So I think we can all agree that um, our subject matter for this afternoon is um, important and it certainly merits our gathering in some impressive numbers this afternoon. My late father told me on more than one occasion that he considered himself to be a fortunate man because the work that he did for so many years was something he enjoyed immensely. And I think I share in that good fortune. Um, I have the great privilege to teach, to research, to write, and also to learn how to be a sociologist at this intense uh, period in our nation's history. So I'm, I consider myself, I would go so far as to say, on a daily basis, I have this tremendous sense of feeling a privilege to be uh, living through this point in time and to have their responsibilities of teaching and learning. Um, so it's, not only is it, a, is it a wonderful time to be living through this present moment, but I think what adds the energy and what adds the kind of buzz to living in Scotland at this time is that we're not just here this afternoon to debate and to discuss in an academic or a contemplative fashion two possible trajectories for our nation. Um, what makes this so significant is that the historical context of our debate this afternoon is that very soon all of these fundamental questions, they're not simply up for discussion, but they're up for decision. On the 18th of December, there is going to be an unprecedented exercise of agency or sovereignty or national self-determination. An act of self-determination that certainly in this part of the world has never happened before. So that's the context in which we meet today. Now, having, I suppose it's my privilege as a sociologist to be fully alive to the, uh, to the various nuances and the profundities of our debate that we're going to have this afternoon. But I think also um, integral to being a good sociologist is to fully realize that there are many people who do not um, welcome this great opportunity um, to um, debate and discuss these fateful questions. I, as a practicing um, sociologist, I have had too many doors slammed shut in my face as I have went about my humble business as a social researcher to know that um, when history calls, it is not always universally welcomed. Um, I think, frankly, many people would rather history goes away and, frankly, that um, we would much rather get back to business as usual as soon as possible, thank you very much. So I'm certainly alive to those two kinds of um, 
um, reality. And I think that kind of prejudgment, perhaps a kind of um, closed mindedness, um, maybe I could say, it reminds me of something that I always try to impress upon my, um, especially my fourth year students, just before they head off and for the very first time and gather their own data set, their own original data in the field. And that is that <clears throat> just as a student goes out and for the first time collects their own original data set and then brings it back, analyzes it, interprets it, tries to suspect what its significance might be. So we can also say that the data that the student gathers sifts the student and finds out whether or not the student is capable of attending to, suspecting, and then the whole laborious process of articulating the meaningfulness of their data. That's a whole work in itself. So if we take that little insight and perhaps apply it more broadly, just as you and I, we are living through historic <coughs> times and we interrogate the times that we are living through, so the times interrogates us back. The times that we're living through and sifts us as to whether or not we are alive to what's new and what's significant. Or perhaps the other alternative is that what we do is we reach for the nearest convenient cliche or we respond to the interrogations of the times by um, hackneyed thinking. Uh, colleagues, we have four fantastic panellists with us this afternoon and I'm sure um, it will be very difficult for any of us to resort to any kind of cliched or um, hackneyed thinking. Um, four fantastic panellists that I'm um, itching to introduce to you. But before I do so, can I just say one or two words about the format of this afternoon? <coughs> Back in September when the sociology team met to prepare for the coming academic session, um, um, as, the, as the phrase goes, it was a no-brainer that we organise, uh, Joe, something for the um, referendum, to mark the referendum. And what we're trying to do this afternoon is two things. <coughs> On the one hand, we, we would like a scholarly and informed and an informative um, debate. And I'm delighted that we have Colin, uh, uh, sorry, we, we have David, <coughs> we have May as our two informative and informed <laughs> academics. <laughs> so we can just go now, Mark. <laughs> and also, of course, what the soci sociology team wanted was also to have something of the cut and thrust of political debate, the clash of ideas and ideologies. Um, I, I would consider myself a, an assiduous follower of opinion polls. And I think we seem to be edging to a kind of even split within the country. And, and I can only imagine that that, that, that division um, perhaps is going to harden and perhaps is going to become a bit more shrill in the coming months. So to reflect that clash of ideas, um, we have Colin um, representing the Yes um, Scotland campaign and we have Mark representing the Better Together campaign. So. Uh, that's our panellists, but before I introduce our panellists, um, oh, sorry, let me just also uh, mention, after we've heard from each of our panellists, um, my only instructions to them has been if they could speak to us for about eight minutes, um, and then... <laughs> not ten, not five. <laughs> well, please don't go anywhere over ten anyway. Um, so after we've heard um, the input, we'll then of course open up to a question and answer session. And then the idea is that we head off to the atrium space and we can carry on our conversations um, over a glass of something in a more informal manner. Um, so that's our, our format for this <coughs> afternoon. But before I introduce um, um, our panellists, I thought it would be a, a useful exercise if, before we hear um, the input, if we took up a, a vote on the question that we're all going to face on the 18th of September. Now you should all have in front of you something that looks like um, a pocket calculator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll, we'll just stay here. Uh, we'll just stay here. Balancing it around. Yeah. Can I just... Um, 
Can I just give those of you who are perhaps um, unfamiliar with YouTube using these little clickers, um, if I give you um, one or two pointers, um, only by pressing numbers one and two can you vote. If you press any other button, nothing happens, I hope. Um, you can only vote once. So. Those of you who perhaps want to press one or two several times to get your side <laughs> up, um, I'm sorry. The first number that you press, um, if you press the pad again, it doesn't register. Um, so please don't press the wrong button because anything else you do after that first press uh, will not be um, registered. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, polling is now open, so please. Um, this is, this is our question. Should Scotland be an independent country? If you agree, please press 1. If you disagree, please press 2. Is anybody still to vote? Okay, I will now reveal all. <laughs> Let me just introduce our, our speakers. Um, I have to declare a um, personal interest in introducing Professor David McCrone, Professor Emeritus of Sociology at Edinburgh University. I had the great fortune of having David as one of my PhD supervisors when I was in Edinburgh during the mid-1990s. Um, I'm not attempting to summarise David's many accomplishments and achievements, but I'll just refer instead to two of David's outstanding books that have been um, seminal, foundational for um, understanding Scotland today. David's um, 1992 text, Understanding Scotland, The Sociology of the State of this Nation, and his 1998 text, The Sociology of Nationalism, Tomorrow's Ancestors, um, meant that David has sealed his place as the foremost sociologist in the second half of the 20th century in Scotland, and has laid down the benchmark for those of us who pretend to follow in his footsteps. Simply put, if a sociology department uh, in a referendum year um, organises something like this, and we don't have David amongst us, um, then we don't have the best minds available to us. So I'm absolutely delighted that David has agreed to be with us this afternoon. Um, so David, thank you very much for uh, being with us. Um, <laughs> to David's left, we have Dr. May Shaw. May is a senior lecturer in community education at Edinburgh University, before which May was a community worker in Edinburgh. May founded and edited for 20 years the journal Concept, and she currently is the editor of Community Development Journal, which is the leading international journal for practitioners, academics, and policymakers across the world. May is the author of many books and articles on community development. Just some of May's areas of expertise include social movement theory and practice, adult education, popular education, an education for the renewal of democracy and community life, not only from a Scottish perspective, but from an international global point of view as well. A theme of May's recent publications is the potential of Scotland to act as an example of the potential contribution of environmental politics and cultural action in the process of democratic renewal. So, May, many thanks for being with us this afternoon. To May's left, we have Colin Fox. Colin is the Scottish Socialist Party's national spokesman and sits on the Yes Scotland Advisory Board. Um, Colin describes himself and the Yes campaign, um, for that matter, as not nationalist, as Yes Scotland is a coalition consisting of the Scottish National Party, the Scottish Socialist Party, the Greens, and many other part, um, and parties who would not traditionally describe themselves as nationalists. Colin much prefers being described 
as a socialist who supports independence and as someone who belongs to the tradition that goes back a century and more to the Red Clydesiders, such as John McLean and James Connolly, two men who both supported socialism and an independent Scotland, um, but whom no student familiar with their work would describe as nationalists. Colin has served as an MSP, and I know he's much sought after as a speaker across the country for his tremendous insight in particular, I would say, into the changing alignments between class and nation uh, that are ongoing in Scotland today. I should also say that this is not the first time that Colin has um, helped out the sociology department, as he has been a, a much sought after informant for some of our sociology dissertation students. So Colin, it's a pleasure to have you back with us this afternoon. Uh, last but not least, we have Mark, uh, Mark Lazarovitz. Um, before I um, say a few words about Mark, can I just say, Mark, I'm extremely grateful for um, stepping in at the last minute, so to speak. Originally, we had Kezia Dugdale, uh, Labour MSP, to be with us this afternoon, but uh, Kezia couldn't make it, so I'm delighted that Mark was able to come. Um, from an organisational point of view, it would be something of a minor disaster if we didn't have something of Mark's calibre to represent the Better Together campaign with us this afternoon. Um, Mark has been the elected Labour Member of Parliament for Edinburgh North and Leith since 2001. Prior to being elected as an MP, Mark worked as an advocate at the Scottish Bar and also Mark was um, leader of the City of Edinburgh Council from 1986 to 1993 and was a member of the Executive Committee of the Scottish Constitutional Convention that helped draw the Convention's proposals for a Scottish Parliament. Included in Mark's many political causes and interests is his commitment to banishing Trident nuclear weapons and his work to promote renew renewable energy and a long-standing interest in transport policy. So Mark, um, very, you're very welcome um, with us this afternoon. So, colleagues, can I ask uh, Professor Macron to address us um, uh, on the issue of the referendum? Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. I'm just going to shout. Can you hear me at the back? Are you all right? Good. Okay. Um, eight minutes. My first task is always to write down when I'm supposed to stop talking, <laughs> um, because I never remember. So I'll write it down. Okay, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm, here, I'm here as the, uh, the sociologist, as the analyst, so uh, as opposed to being party pre. Um, and I'm going to zip you through some slides in terms of making sense of all this, if I can just work this thing um, properly without going backwards, which I frequently do. Okay, there's a back, the back story will be familiar. I won't read it out. But... Um, you can only put these things in historical political context, it seems to me, that um, one of the misapprehensions about Scotland's place within the UK um, is that it was always semi-detached, uh, that Scotland joined the Union in 1707 as a, as a kind of mariage de raison, a marriage of convenience. Uh, and, and although it was an incorporating union, uh, and the UK became a unitary state, there was always the anomaly at the heart of the British state, uh, which was that essentially it was multinational, but it was unitary, that there was a single legislature. And that fundamental contradiction, that anomaly, is, is really what uh, later generations have had to deal with. But it was always there. It was always there. Um, clearly, Scotland held on to many of the institutions that mattered. Uh, the education system, the system of, of, of local government, uh, the legal system, uh, the education system, and so on. So Scotland was always autonomous and self-governing at, at, at one sense, in one sense of that term. It was not <clears throat> incorporated into that union. And indeed, um, many thoroughgoing unionists, laterally, such as Michael Forsyth, um, would argue that the failure uh, to properly incorporate, as he saw it, Scotland into the Union and get rid of these autonomous institutions um, was the problem. But it was, of course, too late uh, to, to do anything about it uh, when he uh, came on the scene. Um, so the backstory is very important because only if you understand how this is located, uh, how Scotland is located in that Union, uh, can you really understand uh, what is going on. 
Um, it, it meant, of course, that uh, Scotland never ceased to exist uh, after 1707. It didn't disappear. It wasn't a self-governing entity. It was a, quote, independent state, uh, but it was autonomous. And why, indeed, Scotland uh, permitted that to happen, if it was a permission that was needed uh, to do that, is, a, is quite another issue. But I won't bore you with that, um, keeping my eye on the clock. Okay, so what, what actually changed? In many respects, the fundamental contradictions were always there, which was the, the anomalous position of Scotland within the UK, the fact that there was a unitary state, that Scotland was a smaller country than England, uh, currently now, of course, eight, eight, five million people, um, eight, and, and England is now 85% of UK population. Um, but the anomaly took a long time it seems to me, to, to, to come to a head, uh, in large part because politically, politically, after universal suffrage, Scotland and England, by and large, behaved in the same way. They, they tended to vote for the same political parties, uh, and for much of the first half of the 20th century, of course, that was voting for the Conservative Unionist Party. Um, and uh, as lots of people, including me, have pointed out, the, the Conservative Party was the only party to win a majority of votes in any general election since World War II, uh, which is a remarkable thing uh, when you think that uh, by 1997 they were down to 17% of the popular vote. So the, the, what brings the anomaly to a head is the political contradiction, the, the divergence of Scotland and England, yes, Wales and Northern Ireland, but Scotland and England because uh, essentially with universal suffrage, Scotland gets the government that England elects. That's just built into the, the name of the system. And as long as Scotland was voting more or less for the same party as south of the border, the anomaly uh, did not have to be resolved. But that anomaly really emerges as early as the 1950s, as 1955. And if you, I'm not going to show you this, but 1955, the, the, the two countries begin to diverge in terms of share of the vote. Uh, for the two main political parties, who of course dominated uh, electoral politics for much of the 20th century. Uh, over 90% of people either voted Tory or Labour um, from, from the, the Second World War onward. So, but, so that emergence, that divergence in politics between um, Scotland and England is really what brings the anomaly to a head. It makes it much more explicit. It creates uh, the concept of the democratic deficit that as a much smaller society of five million people, we get the government, or the potential is there to, to get the government that Scotland did not elect. And of course, that begins to become a very important part of the 1970s, uh, late 1970s politics onwards. Uh, and of course, there are other, <clears throat> there are other aspects of change that, that matter. Uh, the discovery of North Sea oil, huh, which is in the news today. Um, there seems to be a surfeit of politicians meeting in Aberdeen and Port Lethen. Um, but but uh, just as I thought to myself, it's just as well it's not the other way around uh, that, that the UK cabinet's meeting in Aberdeen, which presumably they know where that is. But if they were set the challenge of trying to find Port Lethen, I'm sure they would they would not succeed. Um, I speak as somebody who comes from the northeast. Um, so oil oil clearly is a is a game changer, as we would say. It is it is the aspect that alters the political psychology of Scotland from a situation of being oh well here we are in the union that's the best we can do to imagining an alternative, uh, and this of course uh, creates a stushy in the ducats because the 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 mainstream parties, notably Labour and the Conservatives, then have to confront. Uh, the issue of the anomaly in a much more explicit way. So, um, and the rest of it is very familiar to you, all the way down to the wipeout of the Conservative Party uh, in 1997. Uh, we won't intrude in private grief. Um, <laughs> they, but I want, to focus on, I want to focus on constitutional preferences. If you were the proverbial person from Mars, you would wonder what all the fuss was about, because the historic way of measuring uh, people's constitutional preferences to ask a very simple question. Uh, and certainly since devolution in 1999, there are three options. There is the independence option, there is the, the, the devolution option, and there is the uh, let's go back to what we had before option, if you like, the, uh, the status quo ante. And if you look at that graph, obviously, through time, um, there, there, there would appear to be um, no contest 
in terms of devolution. If you set people the question of which of these do you approve of, independence, devolution, or the status quo ante, then clearly uh, devolution has it. And that was recognized by uh, the Labour and the Liberal Democrats uh, in, the, in the 1990s and, and led ultimately to, to, to what we have now. Um, so what's all the fuss about? Um, the fuss is essentially that, that the devolution settlement uh, was not really a settlement. Uh, it, it was, for the best of reasons, there's nothing wrong with political compromises, I'm a great supporter of political compromises, but it was a political compromise, both in terms of the electoral system, which was much better, if I may say, than what was there before, the first past the post, uh, and it credits both Labour and the Liberal Democrats uh, for producing such a thing, even if it was a cobble. Um, but from day one, uh, it was not enough. And even when the thing was introduced uh, in 1999, um, a majority of people were saying it wasn't enough, that the Scottish Parliament uh, needed more power. And that's been the situation that we've had all the way through. It was better than nothing, but it was not enough. Uh, whether people were misguided or not, for you to decide, uh, but there it is. Um, now, this has, this has moved on, and... Um, we now know, uh, because of the work of the Scottish Centre of, for Social Research and, and the electoral studies that we've been doing, we've been part of, um, that a new dividing line has emerged, if that's what it is. That the devolution settlement uh, said, of course, uh, that people want the first two um, and not the others. Uh, but of course, since we began asking this question, uh, the dividing line between what the Scottish Parliament has control over and what it doesn't, has moved significantly. Uh, and uh, now the only aspect of, of public policy uh, that people in Scotland, uh, this is a consistent finding, I'm just showing you the 2012 data, but it's a consistent finding since we started asking that question in about 2009, um, that uh, devolution max, if you like to call it that, it's an ugly term, uh, but nevertheless, people believe, rightly or wrongly, that uh, the Scottish Parliament should control everything apart from foreign affairs and defence. And that includes taxation, and that includes welfare benefits. And uh, this was a finding long before the Cameron government, in a way, came on the scene. So it's not just the effect of the Cameron government. So that, that's where we are. So that uh, meant that we had to ask a more refined question. And uh, instead of getting terribly hung up on words like independence and devolution or whatever, uh, we came up with a more sensitive uh, uh, form of words, which, which uh, at one end said the Scottish Parliament should have control over all decisions about Scotland, which effectively means independence, uh, all the way through to the one at the bottom, uh, the UK government should make all decisions for Scotland, the status quo ante. So a, a form of words which tended not to use the I word because the I word became... Um, in a sense to some people a red rag to a bull, but we asked the question in a different way. And what do we find? Oh, there we are. Um, and since we've asked that question, we find that public opinion in Scotland is not served by a, a yes-no. Public opinion is not served by a binary divide. Um, there, is a, there are certainly four points in the spectrum, and it is a spectrum of self-government. And people complain that self-government, oh, what is independence? What does that really mean? Is it I think Larry Elliott in today's Guardian described it as a granny flat. Uh, hello, um, you know. But uh, it, what, what does it mean? Um, and, and, this is, and this is clear to me. If you were to ask people, the current state of play in Scotland is that about a third, just over a third of people, say they are in favour of the Scottish Parliament making all decisions, just over 30%, 31, 32% um, support devolution max. Uh, about a quarter support the status quo, and less than 10% uh, support no parliament at all. Now, how do you then compress that public opinion into a straight yes-no? Question, why isn't there a multi-option referendum on the ballot paper? Well, you'll have to ask David Cameron that question. Um, but, but certainly it is a spectrum. It's, that is a spectrum. So when people try and browbeat everyone else over the head by, are you a yes or are you a no, as opposed to a maybe's I, maybe's no, kind of response, um, that reflects much more accurately what people tell us, and there's no reason to think they're telling us a lie. 
Now, so where does this go? We don't know where it goes, but notice that all parties um, support greater change in terms of the people who vote for them, people who identify them. They, the, party, the party leaders may not, uh, but certainly the people who support the relevant political parties do. Now, no surprise that nine out of 10 supporters of the SNP are in favor of independence. You wonder about the other one in 10, but there you are. <laughs> surveys surveys are, are strange beasts. Uh, but, 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 but there you are. At the other end, it's no surprise either that less than 30%, 3 in 10 of Conservatives are, are in favour of greater powers. But look, that two-thirds of both Liberal <coughs> Democrat supporters and Labour supporters um, uh, are in favour of greater powers. And that creates, of course, Labour supporters particularly with a considerable amount of difficulty in this. So the decision process, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to stop just in a minute. Really, literally, <laughs> literally. The decision-making pro process is, is very complicated, and it's especially complicated for one group of people, the 30% who want devolution max. Um, uh, and those people, particularly in the current polls, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, the, the surveys, the social surveys uh, that Scott Sen have been doing, have a very high proportion of don't know. And it's not the usual don't know if you're like, oh, I can't be bothered, don't know. It is genuine, what do I do here? If you are a devolution max supporter, and over 30% of people in Scotland are devolution max supporters, what do you do? You're not in favour of independence, and ostensibly, neither are you in favour of the status quo. You want a more powerful parliament. Somehow you have to manage that decision, the binary choice that's been forced upon you uh, by this process. Um, and that makes it extremely interesting, which is why nearly just you know, almost a half of, of um, Devolution Max supporters are undecided, and they are the game changer. They are the ones who will decide the outcome of this. Let me just do some crude sums with you. Notice that the second choices are in, we don't have a second choice, but if you ask people their second choice, it is very interesting that the Devolution Max people on the second column um, over a third of those people are in favour of independence, 60% roughly uh, are in favour of the status quo, but they split. So if you're looking for some kind of algorithm which would, which would allow you to kind of work out just how those folk will do it, um, and if you are typical, and I'm sure you are, of, of many people in Scotland, then there will be devolution max people uh, among you who can uh, perhaps tell us how you went about that decision. But um, those are the people that really matter. Now, why particularly, it seems to me, as an outsider looking at all of this, are the, are the no campaign interested? Because they know that the, the, the decision will be decided by devolution max people. There just aren't enough status quo, if you like, or status quo anti people to make any difference. The people who will really matter will be the devolution max people. And think about it. If you say about a third, 35% of people in favor of, of independence, clearly not enough. But if you then... If you then partition the devolution max people into a quarter for independence and three quarters not, you get 48%. If you, if you do it one third, two thirds, then you get to 50%. So the, the decision process, the undecideds are very important uh, because they do contain this very important group of people. So there you go, that's it. Um, so what is the future? I have no idea. If you brought a crystal ball, you can maybe, maybe tell us. But, I think it's fair to say that the first two options, the status quo and uh, what was called the Kalman Commission, um, really are history. Uh, and it seems to me we're faced with three options. There's the devolution max option. Where will all this end? If it does end, maybe it just goes on forever. Um, the devolution max option or the confederal option. That is a new kind of relationship. Maybe it is a granny flat. Well, in that respect, the United Kingdom is full of granny flats. Uh, it, it, is, it is part of a kind of structure uh, in which the meaning of independence, the separation of, of one territory from another in the 21st century certainly won't look like what it was in the 18th or the 19th century. Was it ever? Uh, were, were, were territories independent or not? Um, part of this whole debate suffers from what is known as autarky, the, the assumption that independence means that you become like North Korea. Uh, North Korea is, is, uh, gets autarky, but it's not a place you really want to go there. 
I think. I'm sorry if that offends North Korea, but there you are. Um, but essentially, autarky is off the agenda. That is, complete dominant control, fortress Scotland is not an option. It's not the way the world is, except in North Korea. Um, and perhaps maybe not even in North Korea. Uh, so, so, so the debate is much more complicated than simply having to choose between yes and no, and how that is squeezed in. So that's my quick canter through it. I'm sorry I've transgressed the rule, but uh, I hope you can forgive me. Thank you very much. Um, this is uh, a range of quotes about what community uh, might mean. Um, and I'm not going to go over each of them individually, but they're quite similar, you'll see. They say quite a lot of the same kinds of things, a kind of faith uh, in community and a sort of focus on the sort of democratic nature of community involvement. You might not be surprised, some of you, to know that these are all from different political parties, including the Yes campaign and the No campaign. So it tells us something about the politics of community. Uh, it tells you something about the context as well, because if community is the answer, what is the question? Um, and it tells you something about the contestability of community, because every political movement, every political party wants to claim community. Um, I'm interested in the politics of community development, which is my field of uh, expertise, and as an activist in the past as well, and a practitioner. Um, I'm interested in the politics of community development, but I'm also interested in the politics of community, the way in which community is deployed often unproblematically uh, uh, as a way of discussing democracy, its sort of pros and cons. And by that I mean trying to understand not only what professional practice might or should entail, but also uh, about what community development is for, who benefits from it, who loses out of it, if such is the case, and whose interests does it serve. After that, other questions follow, such as who is the community, and indeed what is development from what to what. There is always a presupp presupposition that community development, community engagement, community participation and so on, is always and automatically a positive thing that enables communities to become empowered, uh, to have more say and more democratic involvement. So I want to make uh, a couple of points. Historically, community has been particularly popular with governments as a response to crises of various kinds. Uh, fiscal crisis, legitimacy crisis, law and order crisis, and so on, uh, and particularly to deal with the social consequences of economic crisis. And um, it's no accident that community development and anything community uh, is featuring in policy making across a whole range of areas. Community development has been deployed by successive governments in the UK and elsewhere for a variety of reasons over time and place. And at the heart of community development is the idea of democratic participation. But the question, of course, is participation in what, on whose terms, and critically, with what degree of power. These questions arise, wh whatever the wider political context, and have been a matter of democratic concern for some time. But the referendum context may provide a much needed impetus for a closer and more sustained examination of what community participation might mean in positive and negative senses, and I'll come back to that. But to put it another way, how participation is defined may give an idea or even help to create a vision of what a future Scotland could or should look like. It's important to define community in some workable way. There are tomes and tomes written on the virtues of community, and it's claimed, as we saw from the first quote about uh, community. It's claimed with equal enthusiasm by parties from left, right and centre of the political spectrum and both sides in the referendum debate. In policy terms, however, it invariably refers to poor and marginalised people, often as a suffix to other forms of social division, for example, the mental health community, the black and ethnic community and so on. 
Some people say it's used to define problematic uh, constituencies, problematic for policymakers. It's often accused of supplanting or concealing class as a descriptive term and of acting as an aerosol, covering up, deodorizing those conditions which create inequalities and poverty and dealing only with the symptoms. Since the 1960s or so, the community solution, it's been called, has been seen as an important aspect of policy and never more significant than it is now. It is indeed everywhere, the answer to everything. Can I have the next slide, please? Over time, community participation has been deployed as policy by the state in invited spaces, established, mediated, uh, regulated, and managed by the state for one or more of a number of reasons, some of which you might feel are sort of more legitimate than others. So first of all, as a means of improving uh, decision-making by means of uh, consultation, with of course no guarantees about what uh, outcomes uh, will, be, will be taken into account. Decision-making over matters which are seen to affect people's lives. Um, and in fact, I was, I've just been a community conference in London, I'll mention uh, later as well, but one of the uh, cracks that somebody came up with was instead of making your own decisions now, that communities are being drawn in to make their own incisions, and you'll probably get that joke. Um, as a means, community participation as a means of improving service delivery, you know, creating a better fit between need and available resources, a kind of cost-efficient argument. Uh, through which kind of market research, in a sense, is conducted, offering potential choices, but of course at the same time ruling out others. It can be deployed as a cheap alternative to public services, self-help as a substitute to formerly publicly funded services through taxation. The big society is part of this way of thinking about community, where people are running libraries, community facilities, food banks, and, and all the rest. And in this model, uh, the community uh, is seen as a kind of resource, community participation is a resource or indeed a very big source of free labour. Um, community participation can be a means of uh, legitimising policy and political change, seeking community endorsement or legitimacy for what may not necessarily be popular, such as uh, asset transfer, um, in which communities are invited to endorse what is on offer and there really is no opportunity or invitation to dissent or argument or indeed discussion. It can be a means of incorporating local politics into a kind of preferred model of governance, um, what one person has described as centralised decentralisation, where responsibility is decentralised and power is in fact centralised. And it's run on a kind of franchise basis in the sense that all the important terms and outcomes have already been set with very little room for uh, negotiation. The model is delivered, not negotiated. Community participation can be also a means, finally, of holding problem communities responsible for solving social problems. And we're seeing a great deal of this at the moment here and everywhere else, where communities are being held responsible for, in a sense, managing their own deprivation. But increasingly, as you go down the list, of course, you could maybe argue that community has been deployed as kind of modes of what Foucault, some of you will know here, uh, calls governmentality, which is governments together with mentality, crudely put the ways in which the practices of governance affect the people who are governed, governed their mentality, if you like, uh, includes the way the people end up govern them, governing and conducting themselves uh, as well as, as becoming uh, intertwined with each other and how people, in, in a sense, internalize this new way of governing. Some people have said, in fact, that we are at a stage where uh, government is governing through communities rather than with their uh, participation. And as we talk about an increase, increasingly market-driven state, that often means infecting communities with market practices 
which actually reduce their capacity to resist and to, to ask questions. But there is another model uh, which has been in evidence at particular points in history and particular places and which community development can resource and which is of, probably of central importance when considering the future of Scotland. Could you put that one up for me? This is a model which sees <coughs> participation as a collective social and political process demanded from below through which people learn to be political by formulating collective demands which take into account structural causes of social problems and a critical understanding of the relationships between agency and structure, between micro experience and macro structures and so on, and which is essentially an educational process. Participation here is seen as a means of re reviving the democratic potential of the local and national state through genuine dialogue in which dissent and disagreement are seen as positive, creative, supportive, maybe even representative. The lifeblood of democracy rather than as an irritant or as a burden in which consensus is democratically negotiated rather than assumed. This model derives from the experience of those people and communities who are most marginalized and ha who have least power. And in this model, community becomes a form of collective struggle which challenges and enriches the democratic potential of the state against, against market domination. And that seems to be one of the most critical factors of any kind of democratic uh, participation at the moment. So participation is a challenge to both sides of the referendum argument, for it will require the collective political will of the most marginalized sections of Scottish society who feel they have no stake and who feel that they are not heard. It will take that kind of collective political will to refuse inequality, which will mark Scotland out as a beacon or as a bunker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, and uh, thank you very much for the privilege of joining you this afternoon. Um, I very much look forward to your questions. Mark and I were caucusing there in the corner while there was a technical break, and uh, agreed between us that we'd just speak for four minutes, if that's okay with you, so that you can get to your questions and the wine a lot quicker than ordinarily would be the case. So, uh, with your indulgence, I'll um, run through this twice as fast as I was going to. I wanted to say to you that on behalf of the Yes campaign, the case for independence is very straightforward. The case for independence for Scotland is that we will be economically, socially and politically better off. That's why you should vote Yes on the 18th of September. And in my four minutes, that's what I want to address. Scotland will be economically better off because we are potentially one of the wealthiest countries in the world. The OECD reckons that Scotland will be the eighth richest country in the world if we'd control of our oil and gas reserves. We are a rich country, and if all the taxes, all the wealth that we generated in this country stayed here in Scotland instead of being siphoned off by the UK Treasury, it stands to reason that Scotland will be a richer country and much better able to address those chronic and deep-seated social problems that we have in our society. So we'll be economically better off because we'll be richer in charge of our own decisions, our own finances, our own economies. And you might well ask, what are these social inequalities and these profound social problems that Scotland has? And it's worth touching on them because I remind you that this is the 21st century, just in case you think we're still on David's slides for the 17th century, that one in three children in Scotland live in deprivation. One in three households in Scotland today, February 2014, don't have enough money to pay their gas and electricity bill. There is a chronic shortage of affordable housing in this city, as I'm sure you're well aware. There are many deep-seated and ingrained social problems in Scotland today that will never be addressed under the current political model. Because essentially the political centre of gravity of Scotland 
is social democratic. We believe in public ownership. We believe in eradicating inequalities. We believe in peace. We believe in all these things, and yet what we're offered is a neoliberal warmongering agenda that we have no control over. So politically, independence affords Scots the opportunity to elect the government that we want, not be stuck by a one that somebody else wants and that we are somehow stuck with. So under an independent Scotland, there'll be no more Tory governments. There'll be no more bedroom tax or poll tax. There'll be no more Trident nuclear weapons stationed in the Clyde. There will be no more harrowing inequalities because we don't want them. We've made it clear the political centre of gravity of Scotland is social democratic. And therefore, all we're asking for, for independence for Scotland, is the same as 260 other independent free countries in the world take for granted which is the right to determine our own future, to make our own decisions, rightly or wrongly, but they'll be our decisions. And I would say sometimes these in debates, and I'm sure we'll come to complicated questions in a minute or two, but let's not forget some fundamentals. Scotland, as David pointed out earlier, Scotland is a country. It is a nation. We're not a province or a region of anywhere, and we never have been. Scotland is a nation it's a country within a political union of four countries, at least four countries. And therefore, our right to self-determination for Scotland is something that peoples across the world take for granted. This debate is not about Scotland getting some kind of favours. This is about Scotland taking its rights seriously, its responsibilities seriously, and ensuring that decisions taken here are our decisions. And you have a choice on the 18th of September. You can vote for that vision and that model. Or you can choose to vote no and be well aware that a no vote means more cuts in our vital public services, more austerity, more warmongering, more neoliberal policies, more abrogation of responsibility, perhaps the greatest miscarriage, political miscarriage, miscarriage of justice of our time is that in 2007-2008, the banks bankrupted this country and they were not held to account. In truth, the government has held the poorest people in our community to account for crimes caused by the richest. That's what's happened since 2007-8 to today, with the cuts in public services, the austerity, the attacks on immigrants, the attacks on claimants, the attacks on the vulnerable, are in response to crimes committed by the finance capitalists in the City of London, the so-called masters of the universe. So be absolutely clear, this isn't just a vote for independence on the 18th of September. This is a vote to reject the old style of government, the old politics, and move to more a just, fair, prosperous, and fully self-determined Scotland. And I hope you'll vote for that on September the 18th. Thank you. Thanks again to Queen Margaret to University for inviting me along to come to this meeting today and present the case of why Scotland should stay uh, in the UK. And can I say uh, at the start that I thought David uh, McCrone's very masterly analysis of Scotland's relationship with the rest of the UK over the last 300 years highlights the way in which, as a nation, we have uh, kept our national identity in many, many ways, and even more so since devolution in 1999. But at the same time, it also reminds us of the fact that what we have been in the last 300 years is in one of the longest-running economic political and social unions that the world has seen, and I would suggest to you it is actually one of the most successful unions that the world has seen. We joined with England for various reasons, but amongst what we've got from that is the ability uh, for our businesses to sell throughout the rest of the UK with no barriers, no difficulties to uh, our uh, services in trying to get their uh, supplies and goods to the rest of the country, and it's important you have to earn your money to actually do the wonderful things you want to do with your, your parliaments and your society as well. We've had developed a social union where people in Scotland and England can move amongst uh, different parts of the country. You can go and work in London, come back here if you want to, move around uh, and uh, uh, in, in all sorts of ways in the UK. We've got that ability over the last uh, shred has, has built up. We've also got a political union where the decisions that are taking place in Westminster, which whatever happens, independence or not, are ones which are going to affect everyone's lives fundamentally, are ones in which we can have a major role 
because we have a right to send people to vote in Westminster and take part in those decisions. You see, of course, Scotland, in terms of UK as a whole, is 10% of the population, 10% of the MPs. But you can't disregard England and Wales as some monolith where they all vote the same way, they're all rich folk from Eton who all uh, have uh, all the wealth and everyone else, uh, and, and, it's all, uh, and it's all like throughout, uh, throughout uh, England, Wales, and all Ireland. But uh, Scotland has been able to have an influence in decisions at Westminster precisely because we recognise that many of the problems and issues which we face are ones which also face our parts of the UK as well. And after independence, if that were to happen, we would still have, whether it's a single currency, a currency union, or a separate currency, or some other arrangement, the decisions taken on these issues would actually affect us all fundamentally. And it seems to me that we have a situation where we've actually got a right and ability to influence those through our politicians. If you don't like what me and my colleagues do, you can get rid of us and sack us the next election and replace some other people who have a say in that decision-making process. If you get rid of that in a situation where effectively Scotland's decisions and its destiny are decided in very many areas outside Scotland with no voice and no say, that isn't democracy, that isn't democratic advance, it's actually a democratic deficit. Because what I think Colin and some of his colleagues in the Yes campaign uh, try and portray is this idea that Scotland is, inhe right, uh, is inherently uh, social democratic and left wing, and that England is inherently opposed uh, in that. That is actually a misreading of history. Of course, for the last 20 years, we've had uh, the, uh, uh, the Conservative government, and obviously, we've had the Conservative Liberal Democrat in the last uh, couple of years. But as David pointed out in his earlier uh, comments, that Scotland was the only part of the UK that's ever voted for a majority a Conservative. Uh, 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 politicians. And just as we look across the uh, North Sea at the example of uh, Scandinavia, we've seen there some of the social democratic models, which I'm personally very attracted to, which wouldn't be surprised uh, to, to know, have also now turned into countries which are elected right-wing governments, some was quite extreme and nasty right-wing elements uh, in them uh, as well. And therefore, to say that we should tear up the union of 307 years because we assume that Scotland is going to go in one direction and is inherently going to go in that direction seems to me the biggest mistake of all. I want to see us tackling the problems uh, which uh, have been highlighted of housing, unemployment, poverty, in Scotland, but I also believe we're not going to be able to tackle them effectively by cutting ourselves off from the ability to influence decisions uh, in the rest of the UK in which we, with which we are so fundamentally linked and have been for, for, for more than 300 years. I believe that 1999, when the Scottish Parliament was established, was the beginning of a process. I believe devolution of the Scottish Parliament had been a great success. I would like to see uh, more devolution, more extension of that uh, uh, dem uh, democratic de devolution and spreading of power throughout the entire uh, UK. We can't assume, though, that Scotland uh, by itself will be able to bring about all the changes uh, which uh, uh, many of us would like to see. We heard a lot about community, for example. The fact is that uh, one of the downsides of the blunt the SNP government over the last few years has been a way in which power has been centralised away from local government in, into a uh, into a Hollywood, into the, into the Scottish government. So there's no automatic way in which Scotland will go a left way, a right way, a community way, a non community way. It's up to us to make those decisions. But what I do say is that we can build upon what we've achieved in devolution, and we can do that if we vote to stay in the union. Because if we vote no in September this year, that is a decision which cannot be reversed. We can't come back afterwards and say, we made a mistake, we want to change our minds. We have made the decision once and for all, uh, effectively for all time. I don't want us to make that decision. I don't think the case for the yes side has shown us what is so wrong with the present arrangements that has to be torn up and why we can't build upon that and improve upon that. And there are also many other reasons, many other issues, which is quite fair to ask, is it going to be as straightforward as suggested? I'm not going to go into a currency debate. I don't have time to do that at this stage today. But the fact is, even the SNP, the yes campaign's and the majority's own preference, of a currency union within the rest of the UK, where our currency would still be effectively determined by the U at UK level, where our interest rates would still be determined by uh, a UK, rest of UK organisation, the Bank of England, where our effectively government borrowing would be limited by the rest of the UK. That is not 
choosing your own destiny, but is actually standing aside from the right to influence those decisions, I think we should save in the UK to have that right to influence those decisions, while at the same time building what we've achieved so far, and thereby making sure that devolution works under Scottish Parliament and Devo, Max, whatever happens in the future works for us, for Scotland, but also at the same time recognises that our problems, our issues in Scotland are ones which we share with the rest of the UK as well, and we're better off, better together, trying to solve those together as well. Do you have any? Thank you. Uh, I think the reason you're having a, a referendum is because people are being disillusioned by the Liberal Party and especially the SNP. Uh, and from that, the, the Yes campaign was bossed from that. And I do agree with Colin. I, I do think the, the Yes campaign is a left of centre social democratic movement. Uh, I think the No campaign supports the status quo, which is the right centre conservatism. And my question really is, why is the Labour Party supporting the right centre conservatism? Mark, would you like to begin with that? There are three reasons why we are supporting the campaign to stay in the UK. First of all, if you actually believe that there are real economic risks and difficulties for Scotland becoming an independent state, uh, the issues about the currency, the issues, for example, about uh, what would happen if government borrowing uh, is more expensive in independent Scotland because of uncertainties about a Scottish currency. These things are very technical, but at the end of the day, we may not like the fact that many of these decisions are taken by you know, anonymous uh, finance marks and the rest of it, but if at the end of the day it's going to cost more for Scotland to be independent, um, then you know, you, it's no, it's, no matter how what, wonderful your ideas are, you've got to look at what is the reality of what you can do with your resources. Uh, we do, of course, have had have written off all um, uh, resources over the last uh, 40 years or so. But at the same time, of course, because we are a union, we are, we are able to get a greater amount of resources through the Barnet formula, through the way in which Scotland actually gets more out of UK Treasury than, uh, than we put in. During the crisis in the banks, and you know, no one's a great uh, fan of what the bankers did in the, uh, uh, in the period up to 2007, 2008. The fact is that because the UK is a large state, 60 million people, our economy was resilient. We were able to rely upon the funding and support from the UK system to stop the Scottish-based banks, uh, uh, amongst those, very much amongst those, from collapsing. Now, that, you know, we may not like that we had to set, bail them up, but we had to bail them up because we're in a situation where banks had collapsed. That would have a drastic effect for our economy as well. The second reason I want to too, too long is very simply I want to see for across the UK, people in poverty, people in poor housing, people suffering from the bedroom tax, actually getting. <coughs> a government which is going to take a different approach to what the present government is taking. So I want to see that happening to people uh, in Edinburgh, I want to see it happening for people in London, Liverpool, Manchester and, and, and uh, uh, Birmingham as well. The third one I'll leave because it will take too long. Um, Colin, did you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, it's almost a question to the Labour Party. I'm not in the Labour Party, so I thought I'd have it. Fair enough. Karen? Um, I'm a faculty student here with Sociology and Psychology, uh, and I wonder if I could ask Mr. Fox and Professor McCrone um, if you compare the 2014 referendum to 1979, Labour coming out, left, left politics coming out, Saudi and Labour independence. Can you share that with us, like, your thoughts? I think the question there is, if you compare the 2014 referendum and the 1979, I think one of the big differences is that it seems, I think Karen is saying, that it seems yeah. that the left is solid, solidly pro-independence in a way that it simply wasn't back in 1979. Yeah, I, I, th I thought it was interesting, I got a uh, view of your question before, that you missed out 1997 referendum. Because in many respects, I'm not here to defend any political party, including the Labour Party. But 1997, in a sense, is a slight contradiction to the question. 1979, of course, uh, the Labour Party was, particularly in Scotland, was hopelessly split. That's absolutely right. But 1997, to their credit at least, 
uh, maybe you saw writing on the wall, uh, they, 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 they were responsible for introducing devolution. And, and uh, you know, it could have been a, a done deal, but, uh, but, but that was the case. Now, the broader question of the left, I think, I think it's like, yeah, I suppose taking a longer historical view, the left has, has been, you could not pin down a particular position to, uh, across the left, because the left has included uh, centralists, it's included devolutionists across the board, um, the uh, all, all credit to to uh, to the Democratic Left and the Communist Party, for example, who for a long time, when the Labour Party in that small period had given up on on home rule, uh, it was the Democratic Left and the Communist Party that that kept the flag flying in that respect uh, for for self government within the within the British state. So, it's a, it's a good question. It's a complicated issue in terms of where the left sits, and undoubtedly you will find as you do, um, centralists uh, on, on the left. But you will also find home rulers on the left across the board. So there isn't anything simple. It's, it's much more a contingent rather than a kind of basic explanation as to, as to what goes on. And 1997, in a sense, is, the, is, 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 is proof of that, I think. And within the Labour Party, there's, there's still uh, an enormous variation in opinion, uh, regardless of the fact that that it calls itself now a unionist party, but there's an enormous spread of opinion within the Labour Party and, and, and also uh, within people who support the Labour Party. So, so it's a good question, but don't forget 97. Can I, can I, can I answer Karen's question? I, I won't even remember 1997. To 1979, I, I think the premise of your question is true, it's accurate. 1979, the devolution referendum that was, most of the left across Britain opposed it. Mm. They, were, they were calling for a no vote. Yeah. The Communist Party, the Labour left, the militant tendency, the Socialist Workers Party, most of their attitudes on the left and then were that the Tories, the, I beg your pardon, the SNP were tartan Tories. I'm afraid today that no longer is true and most of the left today in Scotland are supporting independence. Most of the left in Scotland support independence because it's no longer true to say the SNP are tartan Tories to the right of Labour when they're most plainly to the left of Labour, they're to the left of New Labour. So that's a profound change. The other thing I'm bound to say is that, um, and this is a sociological um, study I'm sure you've looked at, between 1979 and 2014, there is a profound turnaround in people's sense of Britishness. 1979, most people, working class people, consider themselves British. 2014, you know, with the census in 2011, and it came out, 80% of people in Scotland consider themselves Scottish, not British. Not Scottish and British, but Scottish, not British. And that's been a profound turnaround. And I have to say that the third aspect of your question, I think, is uh, necessary to focus on. I joined the Labour Party in 1979 in Motherwell. I was the son of a steel worker. My family were steel workers. My male relatives steel workers female relatives were largely in the NHS as nurses. As a youngster, I joined the Labour Party because Tony Benn almost became the Labour deputy leader in 1980. Tony Benn, I said. Not Tony Blair. Tony Benn. Imagine that. Imagine Tony Benn being almost the leader of the Labour Party. I honest, this is planet Earth we're talking about. <laughs> Tony Benn was neighbour. And the fact of the matter is, between 1979 and today, virtually nobody in the left considers the Labour Party to be a vehicle for socialism or progressive change anymore, and Tony Blair and others did their level best to kill that. I think that's the three reasons why the left is now supporting independence passionately, because it's an opportunity to vastly improve the lives of working class people. My name is Joe Goldblatt, and I'm a professor at Queen Margaret University and an expatriate here. Last week in the Scottish Parliament, we voted for the most progressive child benefit in Europe. Before that, we voted for equal marriage. The 17 of 200 and something countries in the world have stepped forward and recognized equal marriage. Could you tell me, please, Mark, where is there similar, similar rather, positive messages coming from Westminster regarding the country that my wife and I have come to love. I've been waiting for months for a message. Mark? 
it's funny that you should, and can I say I'm so welcome uh, your, your wife and the decision she's making, but it's funny that uh, you highlight equal marriage as an example uh, where uh, Scotland is shown away, because as a matter of fact, it was actually in England and Wales where equal marriage went through Parliament uh, first, and I support equal marriage in the uh, UK Parliament, uh, and I welcome the fact that the Scottish Parliament did the same as well. So that's an example. You can't really uh, contrast your know, England reactionary assuming that's your view you can imagine Scotland uh, progressive it is much more complex than that uh, and what it also comes down to I think is you know so to dwell about the economic realities of the difficulties that would take place and our view if uh, Scotland were to or could take place Scotland to leave the UK because at the end of the day if Scotland's situation is riskier and economically uh, worse off, then you cannot do many of the things that you would want to do in however progressive approach you, you, you decide to uh, address any issue. Uh, the fact is also this, that you can't assume, I'm sorry, that Scotland will go one political direction. I mean, the S&P policy, many of their policies are ones which, uh, in terms of a, a low-tax economy, one which very much directed towards supporting business, are not uh, consistent at the same time with a high, ta a high spend economy. You can't have low tax, high spend. These things go, don't go together. And I think you have to look at some of these economic realities, and then you will come to the conclusion that actually your son's interest is not in giving people hopes which will not be fulfilled. Your son's interest is having a long-term uh, sound economic basis for a country, maintaining the market that we have with the rest of the, the UK and not uh, destroying, tearing that apart in a way which then could lead to people leaving out of Scotland rather than, as we've actually seen over the last uh, uh, few years, people actually coming into Scotland. That's something which seems to me would not be of interest of your son. They have to look at the economic realities. There's no point in getting away from them and no point in pretending they don't exist if the challenges in question don't exist just as well. So that's not meant to be negative. It's just saying those who are suggesting change have got to actually answer those questions to say why a new relationship would be so substantially better than the one we have now. I mean, mm, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a lecture, but you, you, raise a, you raise an interesting issue. I think you have to distinguish between what I would call street-level racism and what people say. And although the, the, the proportion of the Scottish population, as you know, is, is, is more white than south of the border, the tendency of people who are not white to give themselves a kind of hybrid identity of Asian Scots or Muslim Scots or black Scots or whatever. That seems to be fairly well established now. Um, whereas it doesn't make us any better than people south of the border, but the tendency of people in England to do exactly what you did, and I was admiring, by the way, your union jack belt when you stood up. That's a, is that a political statement? It's very nice. Um, to call themselves British and not English, either because they feel they cannot be English or they don't wish to be, it's hard to tell uh, the, the answer to that. But there is already a kind of 
of, of dimension. And maybe it's something very fundamental that um, over the last two decades or more, uh, Scotland, Scottish governments of a variety of sorts have tried to attract people in because we lose population people. We're not reproducing ourselves to the same extent. I'm very pleased to hear you're going to have children in Scotland. I think, I think the Scottish population needs it. Uh, but, but that, as, the idea, as opposed to the idea in certain parts of, of England, and only in certain parts of England, that England is full up. Uh, and the fact that there are parties on the, the right, the extreme right, which are highly hostile to immigration and indeed to race issues um, is, is, is also an aspect. But in Scotland, we have a happy coincidence of requiring people to come and to, and to live here and in that context. Uh, being hybrid Scots, because we're all hybrid Scots. We're not, I mean, who is originally Scottish? I mean, that would be an impossible. As, as, uh, as Willie McIlvany said, th this is a mongrel country. Uh, you know, we are mongrels here, uh, and that is something that we celebrate. Okay. Well, could I just say something about that? I'm not yes, sure there's Paul. probably yeah. going to be much difference between us and the panel here about it, but, and, and I, I realise it's possibly a separate issue from this debate, but I'm sure the four of us would agree that it's been a very positive development in the last generation. Mm. There are people who identify themselves as black Scottish, Irish Scottish, Polish Scottish, Asian Scottish. That's a great development. That's what multiculturalism should be celebrated. And regardless of how you vote in this referendum, the country belongs to the people who live here, regardless of the colour of your skin, your gender, anything like that. This is a country that belongs to us all, and equal equality should extend to each of us here. Paul, can I... Paul. Jessica. Paul. Sorry, oh, sorry, yeah, just very briefly on that. I mean, I, yes, I do agree with uh, uh, Colin on that. But again, I have to make this point that you know the idea of that racism. No, well, no one here is saying racism does not exist in Scotland. We all know we know from political campaigning it exists in Scotland, and you know, we've plenty of other examples of that as well. And again, what I want to say is this: is that the idea that independent Scotland will be able to uh, transform itself uh, in a in a different path from that, I, mean, I think it's just, unfortunately, uh, a wrong analysis of the situation. You know, there are many parts of the UK in which we do, the rest of the UK, where you do have a, the same type of integration and acceptance of many cultures uh, that we are talking about here in Scotland as well. And the idea that you know, we can somehow make ourselves, first of all, uh, we, we, the idea we need to be different and break away to achieve that kind of equality seems to me something which is just not justified. I want to see the same type of multicultural uh, uh, amity existing in other parts of the UK as I want to see it happening in Scotland as well. Just to add, add something, um, I mean, I, I do agree. I think that there is a much greater sense of equality in that respect in Scotland, but, you know, there is a Scottish Defence League it's small and, you know, perhaps a bit invisible. Uh, but I know somebody who's very involved in looking into it, <coughs> I hesitate to add, not part of it. Mm -hmm. But apparently, you know, on the um, internet and <coughs> blogosphere and all the rest of it, there is a huge amount of um, anti-racist kind of comment. But I think the focus has changed. And I think we have to be dead vigilant about this, actually. Because the focus has changed. Even the SDL would say, we're not racist. It's the Muslims we don't like. <laughs> so I think there's a kind of switch of focus that we have to be really very careful about, particularly within the whole nature of the sort of security agenda and all the rest. But and you know, people uh, people from different kinds of cultures, different kinds of faiths, and so on, raise real challenges for uh, a democracy. You know, that have to be negotiated. It's not straightforward, I think, simply one welcome, one and all. You know, there are real tensions uh, that are coming up in these kinds of communities. I was just in London at something that impressed me a lot last week. It depressed me because it was so depressing in some senses. Uh, and maybe that's another reason people here are interested, uh, uh, much more interested in, in independence. And interestingly, some of the people there were saying, I hope you do go for independence because we need something to show that things can be different. And maybe that's one of the reasons that people are reluctantly, in some cases, kind of attracted to it. But one of the speakers on one of the panels was a woman called, uh, from what was a project called South All Black Sisters. And coming back to what I was talking about, about community, 
community is represented often as the elders of particular kinds of communities. They're the, the, the community representatives, if you like, the state mediates with, who endorse policies and all the rest of it. This project is set up to act against patriarchy, particularly amongst the sort of uh, certain parts of the Asian community. So we have to be a bit careful about thinking of any kind of community as completely uh, unproblematic. And I would want to see some kind of democratic um, context in which these kinds of really big differences can be kind of negotiated and discussed honestly, where respect for difference doesn't mean that certain difficult questions aren't asked. And I think that would produce a much more kind of vibrant democracy for, for, for all of us. Hi, um, I'm Caroline and I'm a fourth year student in psychology and sociology and I would like to address a question to Mark Lazarowski, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, I'm um, really sorry, um, from the Better Together campaign. Um, as someone coming to live and study in Scotland from an independent country in the EU, can you maybe help me understand why no other country thinks it is um, their in their national interest to share their sover sovereignty with a more powerful and much bigger neighbor? Surely if it was true that it is best to be better together, um, then we would see other countries joining together. But from the empirical evidence, what we can see is that in practice, every country wants its independence and they don't join up with their neighbors in political unions. Therefore, do you not think that the idea of multinational states died out with the um, Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1918? Okay, well, I'm, I'm not going to... Uh I would defend and criticise the Austro-Hungarian Empire. We'll leave that for another time. But the idea that you actually have to have... A nation has to be... Uh, exactly linked to one s state, to one state, one nation, is actually, that's the uh, historic anomaly of the 19th century onwards where you have to have a, a nation state. There's actually many parts of Europe, in fact, uh, where today's states actually do include uh, uh, parts which were certainly one nation, different nations uh, some time ago. If you look at parts of Italy, parts of Germany, many parts of those uh, states were actually uh, uh, separate nations at other stages in the past. But looking to today rather than the Austro-Hungarian Empire of the 19th century, actually the SNP itself wants to see uh, Scotland giving away part of its sovereignty, sharing its sovereignty by entering or staying in, depending on your analysis, a political and economic union, the political and economic union, but it's the European Union. So, I mean, very few people, maybe I don't know Colin Fox, SSP, might, uh, his particular side of the ESCAP might want to, very few people who are actually arguing independent actually want to say that Scotland should not be part of a union in which sovereignty, a certain amount of sovereignty is given away in return for the ability to influence those decisions. What I'm saying is actually we are now in a political union with the rest uh, of the UK, economic and social Union. Is that something which operated so badly that it needs to be uh, torn up? I would suggest that, yes, of course, we all, it always develops and changes. Uh, all, all things can, can be improved, but certainly we uh, need to stay in that current political uh, union precisely because those who want independence want to see Scotland staying in the economic union. They want to see it staying in the fiscal union. They want to see it staying in the regulatory union. What is, what, what is, the, what is the advantage in wanting to have all our decisions on so many areas still being decided by the rest of the UK be giving up our right to influence them by being part of that political union? So I think, in fact, uh, it's not uh, those who uh, want to see us staying in the same political union out of touch with moving the trends in Europe. It's actually those who want to end the political union as well as end the economic union at the same time. Well, can I answer that? I think that's yes. the, that question you asked, I think, uh, you said you've come from Germany. Germany. And, and I understand entirely people come and they find the British political system <laughs> utterly peculiar. Mark made a point before when he's saying, if you vote yes, you should remember it's going to be permanent. <coughs> well, the other thing you should remember is that no country that's ever voted for its own independence has ever changed its mind and gone back to what they had before. <laughs> 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 
Labour has now joined the EU. Yes, it's the real unity, you think. Is there's confusion right at the very heart of this, all round about us? You know, Ed Davey, there's a cabinet up in Aberdeen, isn't there, today? Mm -hmm. Cameron and the crew have come up to Aberdeen. The second cabinet meeting, you'll be glad to hear, in 80 years, yeah. right? So they've managed to find out where Scotland is. And Ben Davey is on Radio 4 this morning. He's in Aberdeen doing an interview talking about this country. So I think, oh, he's talking about Scotland. He's in Aberdeen, it's this country. And of course he's talking about the UK. And so you've even got cabinet ministers who talk about this country. Britain is not a country. It never has been a country. It's at least four countries from what I can see. And it's hardly any wonder people coming from abroad to study the mother of parliaments in this great tribune of democracy that we sell to the rest of the world uh, get confused about it. And Mark himself's confused about it. He talks about people here in Edinburgh. He wants to fight for them in the same way that he fights for people in, or supports the rights of people in London, Liverpool, Bristol. And that's completely correct. That's a good socialist tradition. And you heard it from Mark, so there's another exclusive. But the fact of the matter is, I lived in East London for 10 years. I bring you the news, London is not a country. I bring you the news, Liverpool is not a country. I bring you the news that Bristol is not a country. There is something called the national question at play here in politics. And you have to recognise that, of course, I mean, the left talk rightly about working class solidarity. Very, very important to us. We share a great deal in common. Those of us here with people in East London and Bristol and Liverpool and Birmingham and elsewhere because we sell our labour on a daily basis to pay our bills. That's what makes us working class. But that unity, that solidarity doesn't somehow stop at the English Channel. It doesn't disappear when you get to water. We share it with people in Johannesburg, uh, Buenos Aires, America, Beijing, Delhi. It's shared be all across the world. And the struggle for self-determination isn't therefore somehow conflicting with the struggle for the emancipation of working people, it goes hand in hand with it. And I think that's at the centre of this debate, frankly. But, but, but the, difference, the difference is no one is suggesting that people in Johannesburg should actually be able to run our economy, which effectively is what will be happening in the Yes campaign and their model for independence and also their model of still remaining in the EU, which I would support. But at the end of the day, they're still wanting a political union uh, on many, in, in many, many aspects and many, many respects but they want to give up the ability to influence that decision. Uh, I'm uh, Michaela, I'm a student fourth year here. First and foremost, I'd like to identify myself as British, but with an English accent. Um, that in itself has given me plenty of challenges since I moved to Scotland, far north of Scotland when I was 10. Now, when I moved to Scotland, I was absolutely overwhelmed by the cultural benefits of being Scottish. I was well aware of the culture of this country and it was beautiful to me it was a refreshing experience but i know plenty of people that if independence goes through have actually opted to say they'd leave and that's something that would worry me as somebody that is i've got no plans on leaving if independence goes through there's pros and cons on either side for me but it worries me to think that there's people scottish people who've lived there their whole life that want to leave because independence goes through so I'd just like to see what maybe Colin would say to how would you convince those people to stay in their homeland if something goes through they don't want? Thank you for the question. My answer would be I'd hope you wouldn't leave. This country, <laughs> the, the country belongs to you as much as anybody. Of course, we live in a democracy. And I have to say to, to you, as a socialist, who's lost far more elections than ever won. <laughs> I, only, I only won the one, and even then only get 5.5% of the vote. You work it out. Anyway, the fact of the matter is, it's democracy. It's our right to decide what we want to be, and we all have to participate in that. And when the decision's taken, we all have to respect it. That's the great challenge of democracy. And I think what you hi highlight in your question is really good. You know, there's essence there. Because it's, Mark will suggest, I've exaggerated the differences between Scotland and England. I've exaggerated the sense that Scotland is so democratic and England, certainly the southeast of England where the government is headquartered, is neoliberal. Well, I would remind you, the Scottish Parliament abolished prescription charges. There's still £7.50 an item in England. The Scottish Government abolished elderly care charges. The Scottish Government abolished tuition fees. The, you know, you can go through a long list of things that make Scotland different. I, I would want to say to you, Maybe you consider the appellation that you're English Scottish. 
because that's something else I think 10% of people in Edinburgh consider themselves to be English. It's their city as much as anybody's. I don't, I don't have any truck with this idea that somehow Scots are better than anybody else. We're not better than anybody else. I didn't choose to be born in Muddle. It's a lucky to draw. The fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, we're not better than anybody else, but we're not worse than anybody else either. That's what equality pertains. Simple. Hi there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm Hannah. I'm a fourth year drama performance student here. Um, Mark, my question's for you. So I'm going to ask you a question. David Cameron made us ask a really difficult question, and our answer has to be a simple yes or no. So can you please give me a yes or no and ask you this question? That's a good question. <laughs> Uh, okay, so my question for you is, Mark, as a Scot, does my vote matter in the United Kingdom? We want a simple answer. The answer is yes, but you. But as you're going to come back at me, I think I'll have a, a, go on a, a bit. Say no as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Colin. Yes, of course, you, you, your vote matters, and what. I want to see is a government, first of all a government in Scotland, the, the Scottish Parliament, but a government in the UK as well, which is going to take the country in a different direction than it's been taken uh, at the moment. And I want to see you and uh, everyone else uh, hopefully voting for the Labour Party, ideally, but maybe you won't in the next uh, UK general election, to bring about a change of the direction of the UK government, uh, just as I also want to see us working to ensure that devolution is strengthened uh, 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 as well in a way that I think many people in Scotland want. Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, well, you said yes. Okay. Well, it's interesting because, as you're probably going to predict, my vote doesn't really matter in the United Kingdom. I didn't vote for Conservatives, or to be my Prime Minister, I didn't vote David Cameron. I didn't vote for Lib Dem. Well, actually, I did vote for Lib Dem. Was, <laughs> but, 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 like, I didn't vote for David Cameron. Most of the people in Scotland, did you vote for David Cameron? Did most people here vote for No, we didn't. We didn't. This is the thing. See, if I were to stay in the United Kingdom, if I'm to vote no, I'm going to continue having these, you know, going to the general election, voting for people, but it doesn't even matter what my vote's going to say. It's not going to matter. So I'm going to vote yes so that I can have a say about who is going to be in my parliament, who's going to be sitting there making the decisions for me, for my country. And I just want to say as well, you know, you say that we can sack you. If you said that yourself, and I quote, you said you can sack us. No, I can't. I can't sack who's down there. You know, we only have a tiny proportion of our government. You know, you said that we have an influence of our parliament. We might have an inf a tiny bit influence in our Scottish parliament. We don't have an influence let's go down in Westminster. I don't want a House of Lords. I want a House of Commons, and I want a House of Commons in my country. Thank you. Okay. There's uh, obviously a, a number of points there. Uh, you asked. If anyone here voted for David Cameron, I suspect they probably wouldn't have admitted it if they had. But uh, uh, it, it actually makes an important uh, point, actually, because if you look at the last votes in the last UK general election here in Scotland, it is actually a fact that, first of all, obviously the party that had most votes, and the majority was Labour Party, the SN, but if the parties of the coalition, the Conservative SNP, the uh, Conservative Lib Dem together, got almost as many votes in Scotland as the Labour Party did, and got... Not quite, but it was twice as many votes as the SNP did. I think we got 19%, they got 36 or so percent in the last UK general election in Scotland. So actually to say that everyone in Scotland is going to vote for the SNP or left-wing parties all the time isn't actually true. So that's, a, so that's the first point. To suggest that you should verify turn over that uh, a relationship which has lasted for 300 years because of what has happened in some elections recently is... I would, I would say is a, it isn't, it isn't a, a, a log logical conclusion to reach. But our point, the key point I, I think I was making was this, was that even if Scotland goes independent, so many decisions affecting Scotland because of the way in which our economies are so integrated, our social unions are so integrated, are still going to be made in Westminster. And we will have no say whatsoever in that decision-making process except what the Scottish Government can negotiate 
as a relatively weak partner compared to the rest of the UK with the UK government. And that is a reality of always situations. That is what faced you're from Northern Ireland, but you know the reality that faced Ireland when it had to go cap in hand to the, uh, uh, to the international community to get bailed out during its economic crisis. That is not, for me, an improved situation. I want to actually see the best of both worlds, where we do have a Scottish Parliament which can have real power over vast areas of Scottish life, but at the same time, I want to see the strength of being in the UK and drawing upon the UK and drawing upon the UK's strength internationally as well. Because one point earlier made on was about the way, what has the UK done, at, you know, which we you know, find uh, uh, morally uh, uh, impressive, shall we say. One of the things, for example, is that when it comes to what we do in international development, in the way that we actually, as the popular but one of the, the, the most progressive, and this, because even amongst the present government, of the major economies in the world in what we do in terms of uh, uh, support for uh, overseas aid and for uh, development in the, uh, throughout the world, we're actually one of the most advanced, and we can influence that at UK level. Scotland, I'm sure, would want to get involved in that in a progressive way if it became independent, but Scotland would still be a relatively small, small country or a relatively small voice. So yes, you give up some things if you choose to become part of a wider union, but you also gain influence as well, and that is the balance which, to me, leads us to a very strong argument why we should stay within the UK while well, becoming separate. Colleagues, we're nearly at 5 o'clock. I'll take three more questions, please. Um, Jessica, the third row, chat with the um, denim shirt. Oh, sorry, our denim shirt. Mark, you're talking about um, you know, the, the government in the UK uh, rescuing us financially when, in fact, it was the UK government following the lead of the American government who deregulated the banks that allowed the banks to roll us point. So, can we get out of sleep? Could you answer that? Why that was allowed to happen? And why we still have a problem, have a problem regulating London? The Vince Cable recently described uh, London as having sucked the lifeblood in the rest of the country, like Scotland, North of Ireland, <coughs> a lot of places, and, you know, it's a bit like we in Dracula in charge of the blood bank, I think some of us said that we just, you know, you, you, you have been, there's a lot of political scaremongering, I feel, from the no campaign, it's not really working, because what's happening is, uh, you know, you're trying to lecture us about how Scotland may well, we might get into some sort of financial difficulties when we're now 1.3 million pounds in debt because of, you know, what's happening in London and, and, and the, 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 the hegemony of the London administration. So, you know, better together. Tell me how it's better together, please. On the question of the, the banks, blank, bluntly, all political parties took the wrong approach to regulation of bank deregulation uh, in, in, in the period running up to the crash. And, you know, Alex Salmond, Mayor of SNP, were amongst uh, some of the wrong approach. I mean, Alex Salmond, you've probably seen that yourself, in which is, you know, been very uh, positive towards Fred Goodwin via then uh, uh, Chief Executive of RBS. So I mean, all parties made that mistake, and it was a mistake, it's a mistake that my party uh, made, made as well. But my point is that, like it or not, there was a financial crisis affecting our banks, and they had to be bailed out, or else the uh, financial crisis could have brought our economy down and could have led to the same consequences that happened to Greece and Ireland as well. The difference was that just as you had any other area of the economy, because you're part of a bigger state, a bigger economy, you're able to provide resources from within that bigger economy, a bigger state, to actually get you through those difficulties. Ireland, uh, for example, and Greece were not able to do that, nor was Iceland. They had to rely upon the international community into a degree which we did not. And I would just say that in a country like Scotland, which has very many strengths, but is also relatively uh, limited in its economic uh, diversity, it is better to be able to call upon uh, that strength of a wider uh, state and a wider economy and to uh, uh, leave ourselves in a weak position of a smaller economy and a smaller state. So that's, uh, that's the argument. I mean, I didn't like what the banks did, but we had to, we had to, something had to be done, and we were more able to do it in the UK. So the people of Iceland took a vote on it to say not to pay it. Well, I think, uh, uh, I, I, think the, I think the Icelanders are still having a lot of difficulty because of what happen, happened then. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think anyone would suggest what uh, is happening in Ireland and Greece has been uh, very positive. And they were very much dependent upon, um, in their case, probably the EU. But at least being part of the EU, both Ireland and Greece were actually able to have some say in the decision-making process because they do have uh, MEPs, they have European commissioners, all the rest of it. They have a political say 
uh, in a way which Scotland would no longer have if Scotland was to be a separate state. That's, you know, that's the way it goes, fine. That's, you know, people make that choice, but I would say it's better to keep that voice, keep that influence, uh, than, to, uh, than, to, than to throw it away. Colleagues, we're nearly tightened up. I'm going to take one last question from the gentleman in the uh, end of the show. It's not them. It's Lennon and Jigsaw Ventures. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I suppose that kind of brings me on to my question quite nicely, is that um, a social democratic state is something that, that gets bandied around quite a lot and something which is um, naturally quite appealing, I think, to a lot of people in Scotland. But what I'm struggling with is that it's a little bit like a diet pill at the moment. That someone's suggesting to me that if I vote for independence, all of a sudden I become socially democratic, and I personally have to give up nothing in order to achieve that. Now, whether there's an element, um, or certainly there's a lot of things that have been horrendous about a very neoliberal state, but equally, I'm sitting here as an educated, affluent, middle-class individual wearing my jigsaw shirt, um, and I'm being told that if I vote for independence, I can suddenly become socially democratic, and if it will only require big businesses, bankers, somebody else to change. What I want to know is, if I vote for independence to live in a socially democratic state, what are the hard things I'm going to have to do in order to transition into that better future? Because at the moment, it seems to be a magic diet pill that requires me to do nothing in order to get something better. Colin, would you? Yeah, I was going to offer two colleagues here. I, 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 I would say to the gentleman in the blue shirt there. <laughs> I think two things to bear in mind. I, I try to convey in my remarks that it's not a choice between yes and this you know, progressive social democratic vision of the future and the status quo. The status quo is not on the table. We can forget it. What you're talking about with a no vote is more austerity, more cuts, more warmongering, more scapegoating immigrants and claimants. You have that if you want. But be clear that's what you're getting. It's not just the status quo. I think that's really important. And you're asking a perfectly reasonable question. You know, my understanding of social democracy, and by the way, I should put my cards on my table, I'm not a social democrat, I'm a socialist. Social democracy is about upholding capitalism. Socialists want to replace capitalism with a far better system, but that was the question you asked. Me. Social <laughs> democracy involves the redistribution of wealth. So if you're well paid, you'll pay more taxes, my friend, and that's right, because what should happen is to redistribute the wealth, we have to take it from those who have, and give it to those who haven't. I, I can't address that up. That's just a truism. And under social democratic you know, conditions, we want to see the wealthy paying taxes for a change, what well, they currently don't. You know, they talk about all these billionaires who rush to London. Yeah, why did they rush to London? Is it because they like the drinking water that's got lime scale on it? <laughs> Is it because they like the rat race, all the things that are wrong with London? No, they went there, Abramovich and all the rest of them, because they didn't pay any taxes. And I'm Brit and Blair invited them. to billionaires again, as opposed to me. Yeah, well, you look like a billionaire, that's <laughs> my opinion. <laughs> and you're wearing, you're wearing yeah, a billionaire's blue shirt. <laughs> the point is, you're asking me what hard decisions you're going to take. Yeah, you, you're going to make hard decisions. Don't dress them up. You're going to have to start taking responsibility. You're going to have to start shouldering responsibility for running this country with five million others. No blaming anybody else for a change. We've got to say, and I think this is May's territory, we've also got to say, stop leaving it to me and Mark all the time. I'm knackered taking decisions <laughs> on behalf of you. You've got to get active. You've got to get active to get changed. And if I can make this distinction, I, I was an MSP for four years. I never liked being called a politician. I consider myself a freedom fighter, but... Whereas, whereas politicians are very, very lowly regarded in society, I happen to believe that political activists are highly regarded because it's where change comes from. Civil rights activists, equality activists, feminists, socialists, trade unionists, they are the heart of our society. Without us, you've got nothing. And you know, I want everybody here to understand this is your country and you better start realising you've got responsibilities to shape it and don't leave it to anybody else. Hard decisions. So let's take um, a second poll, please, on our question. Should, should Scotland be an independent country? To see if there's been any change um, thanks to our input from our panel. So um, I see you're all busy voting. I'll just give you a couple of minutes and then we'll uh, find out 
that could be the dramatic change. Can we just uh, put our hands together in appreciation for it?